triptidines, alkaloids, resarpine type indole alkaloids, indole fused triterpene derivatives, organometallic complexes, vanadium complexes, ruthenium complexes, and tin complexes, which were, which were also identified as new and novel synthetic alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Here in this case, we would, uh, I would like to show I would like to uh, show the structure activity relationship studies. So as we have several classes of alpha glucosidase, uh, it is very difficult to uh, make SAR and to uh, talk about all the different classes. But here I'm picking up on natural, natural class of the alpha glucosidine inhibitors, and that is the flavonoidal class. And it is a very interesting uh, class of uh, natural compounds. As I'm showing you, the, the, all the compounds are naturally isolated and characterized, and here I'm presenting this. Here, uh, the if we look at the compound two, the methoxy group at two prime position, C2 prime position, is very crucial for the activity. If it is replaced by the hydroxyl group, as it is in case of compound three, the activity is falling down drastically to 1100 11, 11, micromolar. And Similar uh, thing um, observed when methoxy group at C4 prime position improved the activity further 1 to 114 micromolar, which is 3.7 times more active than the deoxynus romancin. Here, um, similar effect also uh, found in case of compound 7. Here, methoxy group at C1 prime position showed IC50 value 67.0 micromolar, which is 6.3 times more active than the standard. If it is replaced by hydroxyl group, in case of compound six, the, again, the activity is dramatically fall to 400 micromolar. So here in these cases, we see that methoxy group playing crucial role, perhaps it has hydrophobic interaction with the enzyme binding active site. And this compound eight and nine showed IC50 value 466 and 1200 micromolar. And flavonoids, these are the numbers, compound 16 to 20, they showed IC50 values within a range from 50 to 499 micromolar. And flavonoid, flavonoid, flavonoids, 21 to 25 number compounds showed IC50 value 12 to 94 micromolar. And these are the flavonoidal glycosides. As we can see, there are different kinds of glycosides attached to the flavonoidal flavonoid, uh, flavonoidal structures. And it showed IC50 value from 131 to 367 micromolar. Here we can see that this is a wide range of uh, uh, activity, 131 on the other hand, 367. Among all the flavonoidal glycosides, routine showed IC50 value 337.445 micromolar, which is the most uh, active compound we found among the uh, flavonoidal glycosides. These are the kinetic parameters. Compound 16, 17, 18, and 19 showed linear mixed type of inhibition. On the other hand, compound 20 to 27 showed non-competitive type of inhibition. Here in this um, compound, except compound 29 and 30, all the compounds showed non-competitive type of inhibition. Here I'm going to explain uh, the competitive type of inhibitions. And this is the line weaver work plot, as we can see. Here, the Vmax is not at all affected by the increasing the concentration of compound 30 at 21, 43, 87, and 175 micromolar. On the other hand, as we can see, apparent came increases with the increasing concentration of inhibitor concentration. So compound here, this is the structure of the compound. Here we can see the compound 30 is a C-glycosylated um, flavonoid where R, R, R is glucose. Increase in came here we can see the increase in came caused decrease decreasing the substrate affinity towards the enzyme, which suggests that this compound compete with the substrate. The Ki is directly determined from the secondary Dixon plot. Here we can, we can see the Dixon plot and the, from the secondary Dixon plot, we can, um, we, can, um, we, we can identify this is the competitive type of inhibition. Here, uh, this is the secondary Dixon plot also confirmed the competitive type of inhibition as the straight line is going to through the origin. Now, what is the competitive type of inhibition? Competitive type of inhibition is the, is the type of inhibition where the enzyme binding site, this is the same binding site where, where the, um, the active drug or the uh, inhibitor and the substrate competing for the same active site. And all the compounds were subjected for the cyto cytotoxic uh, assay and except compound six, all the compounds show non-toxic uh, behavior in nature. Now I would like to, um, um, I, I would like to uh, share with you the, what is 3D QSR. 3D QSR, uh, the QSR is a mathematical relationship between biological activity of a molecular system, its geometric and chemical characteristics, 
QSR attempts to find consistent relationship between biological activity and molecular properties. And thus these rules can predict the activity of a new compound. So there are some prediction. We can, we can uh, predict the uh, modification of the structure for the new drug synthesis and as well as modification of the drug. These are the various steps of the 3D QSR. A 3D database is created on Cebu 6.9 Tripos Associates. Here are all the charges, uh, charges because all of the compounds, so whether it is natural or um, synthetic compounds, they are having the all the charges on these compounds uh, of 26 flavonoids calculated by Gas Tiger Hookel Church and all the structures minimized. And here we can see ring A and ring B. These are the rings of the flavonoids. And in case of flavonoid and isoflavones, the third ring, uh, uh, third ring is variable. So here we can see the ring A and ring B. These are superimposed because they are having the sp2 hybridized carbon atoms. And this, uh, in case of the ring C, here in this, this is in case of flavon, and this is the in the, the following ring is the isoflavon. Uh, for the ring C is in case of isoflavon. And then uh, steric and electrostatic field ener energies were calculated in case of COMFA and COMSIA. Hydrophobic and hydrogen acceptor fields are calculated in case of COMSIA. Regression analysis were performed uh, through partial least square method, PLS matrix, using full cross validation, leave one out method. So during the, the 3D QSR running, uh, so when we are we, we followed this method, so we had the uh, best model um, on the basis of our statistical correlation values. So we removed 20% of the compounds from the training set and reran the QSR and used it to predict the excluded compounds. This was repeated a further four times. Here in this case, we uh, repeat for four times. The R square conventional correlation coefficient found point 0.905 in case of COMFA and 0.935 in case of COMSIA. QSCOR or cross-validated correlation coefficient found 0 0.6, 0 0.605 in case of COMFA and 0.602 in case of COMSIA. Finally, we uh, get uh, the counterplot for COMSIA and COMFA. And these are, this is a table where the blue colored, uh, blue, blue colored compound represented the actual IC50 of the compounds. On the other hand, purple color com column presented the values of predicted IC50 value in case of COMFA and COMSIA. Here we can see the, the model was a very ideal model because if we consider the compound 25 here, we can see the actual IC50 value 3.61. On the other hand, the predicted IC50 value is 3.56 and 3.564 in case of COMFA and COMSIA. Similar uh, effect, similar result we found from all other compounds as well. Here the actual log IC50 value is presented in blue colored column. And here, this is the COMFA model finally came out that we uh, get the COMFA models. COMFA counterplot showed sterically favorable region, which is presented through the green uh, green counterplot here we can see. And uh, sterically, and uh, this is this green color we found in case, on ring C in case of the flavonoids. And sterically disfavorable region, which is yellow in color here on the, on, on the bottom, we can see yellow counterplot. And this is also found in case uh, on ring C, but this is in case of isoflavones. So here, which proves that flavonoids are more active than the isoflavone class of the compounds, and flavonoid glycosides are less active, and as the glycoside residues are present at sterically dis disfavorable region, yellow in color. And this is the this is the COMSIA model. I'm discussing the COMSIA model with, uh, with the help of one compound, which is compound number five. And this has IC50 value 40.73 micromolar, which is quite active for the potent compound. In COMSIA, there is an additional sterically favorable region is found near C7 position. And this is the journal moiety of compound five is passed through this region. Thus, it can be suggested that in future, if you work with the flavonoid class of compounds, so bulky hindered group at C7 position may further improve the activity, perhaps it has hydrophobic interaction with the enzyme binding site. And this compound is 10.4 times more active than the standard uh, nezromycin. So besides the flavonidyl class, we, um, we worked with physalin as a new class of the compounds. Here we can see IC50 values. Um, uh, there are various IC50 values here. This is isolated from physalis minima. 
Plumyricin, this is another new class of compounds when this is a very potent compound, potent class of compounds we identified. And this, then we subjected this compound for the cytotoxicity um, assays as well as anti-cancer acid. Here we can see this is the control, the top left, the, this, uh, the, uh, this slide is the control and we can see confluent cell growth. On the other hand, with the compound one, two, and three, these are the plumyricin and isoplumyricin, falboplumyricin. In the presence of falboplumyricin cells, phased apoptosis and aggregated, thus uh, the growth of the normal cell line hampered. And this study conducted on breast cancer cell line, AMDA, AMB231 cell line. This is the acylfluoroglucinal class of compounds. This is, these were isolated from mitis communis, mitis C. And uh, cytotoxic evaluation of the fluoroglucinals uh, Compound showed these are all of the com except compound four, all the compounds are non toxic. All of the compounds showed non toxic behavior on C3T3 cell line except my mitalin B, which showed IC50 value 19.2.02 micromolar. Perhaps due to its less molecular weight, it easily penetrated to the cell organs and erased the cell growth. This is the internal class of the compounds. So these were isolated from Har Haraguana uh, Madagascar. I am not going to discuss all uh, all of the uh, SAR due to the shortage of the time. This is a novel uh, class of the compound. This is uh, dubolan. This is a novel triterpene skeleton. Uh, as we know, uh, as the natural as natural product chemist, that uh, for the this uh, seven membered ring, uh, this is responsible for this uh, novel class because usually in triterpene class we don't see seven membered uh, ring. This is uh, for for the first time this uh, this skeleton is reported a total 31 triterpene from different classes were included in the study and some of them presented in this just in this discussion so so far we um uh, we um, worked on varnini anthelmintica as well so we isolated um uh, some uh, gly glycosidic compound from uh, steroidal glycoside from this and some of these plants we subjected for uh, our clinical studies. Here we can, you can, we can see there are different medicinal plants. We, um, we had different number of medicinal plants for superficial skin disease infection. Here we started nine cases studies of chronic dermatitis. Here, this is the case number one. Here we can see left hand side. This is the this is a severe infection. Uh, it, it, we conducted clinical trial on this patient who had chronic eczema and superficial bacterial infection. She developed resistance to all conventional antibiotics and steroidal therapy. We can see the CRF severity on the right hand side of this uh, slide. The superficial bacterial infection were treated and cured after within the two weeks, we can see the smooth, uh, smooth skin of this at uh, right hand side of our slides. And this is the before the treatment, this is after the treatment. The clinical trial conducted in alternative uh, medicine department conscious to Kendra Sava Dhaka. This is the Herbarium species number. And this, these are, this is another uh, case study. And here we can we uh, observe the fungal infection of the patients, and this is after the to after the treatment where we can see the infection is not visible. Uh, this is case uh, case studies three. So here uh, we can see the before the uh, uh, infection, and this is after the infection. So uh, we uh, conducted several uh, clinical Wait, studies on several. Few, you have two minutes, please. Okay, so I'm concluding. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hadi. So this is the, the different medicinal plants. All the medicinal plants were subjected for the histopathological studies. And this, these, are the, uh, these are the some histopathological slides. And uh, these, are the, uh, these are, again, histopathological slides of, the, of different kinds of medicinal plants. Uh, thank you so much. I'm acknowledging, uh, acknowledging uh, uh, my research work uh, for uh, my uh, laboratories and my uh, pre, pre, uh, my uh, uh, collaborators and also the grants to us and OWSD grants, Comstec grants, International Center for Chemical and Biological Sciences grants, East West University Faculty Development Fund. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Shamsun. You almost Thank welcome. you for this nice, uninterested work. Thank you. So now uh, we have Dr. Shaima. Shemainani from Egypt, yes. from the Swedish General University. Okay, doctor, so hope you are fine. Yes, I'm fine, thank you. Okay, thank you. So you have or the mic is for you for 15 minutes. Yes, uh, but uh, please could you uh, unshare uh, so I yes, can share sure, my sure. presentation? Okay. Okay, sure, sure.
So, is it working? So, I unshared it. No, not yet. <laughs> not, not yet, oh, sorry. Is it okay now? No. Doctor, mm -hmm. doctor, mm -hmm. yes, Professor yes. Shamsun, just only yes. click on, on the bottom, mm -hmm. share screen, click on it. Okay. And stop sharing, only yeah. click stop sharing. I think it worked now, is it working? You need to I make it stop, this will stop other screen sharing, just click on it. Okay. Uh, yeah, again. So Oh. Now stop sharing only. Okay, now so as well. Yes. Now my now. Yes. is yeah. okay. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Shamsun, for your nice yes. presentation, and uh, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, hello, I am uh, Dr. Shaima Inani. I am uh, an associate professor of microbiology in Egypt, and uh, today I will talk about the bacterial taxa migration from the Mediterranean Sea into the Red Sea which revealed the higher prevalence of anti lysepsia migration. Uh, as all of us know that the Suez Canal is a connection between the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea. And uh, after the connection occurred between the two seas, there is a mini migration between macroorganisms and microorganisms started to happen. Uh, many macroorganisms migrated from Mediterranean Sea to Red Sea and vice versa. Uh, the migration from Red Sea to Mediterranean Sea is known as Lysepsian migration, and from Mediterranean Sea to Red Sea is known as anti Lysepsian migration. Uh, as we see in the macroorganisms, most of the uh, common migration occurred is Lysepsian migration, and this is responsible for most of the alien species which is present now in the Mediterranean Sea. Invading species compete with the native species which is present in the environment. And this is not usually means a bad effect because many times this may make uh, like a, a richness in the community which allowed for a differentiation in the microorganisms. In the microorganisms, we found that lysepsian migration is more dominant especially in the large organisms. And this is because of two factors. One of them is that the migration between the Mediterranean Sea to Red Sea is usually occurred due to the less salinity of the Mediterranean Sea. And because the Mediterranean Sea is more rich in nutrients than the Red Sea, which allow a better life and better migration environment for the organisms. And the second reason was in the past, uh, there was uh, before building the high dome, uh, there was a Nile flood which is uh, usually allowed a flood of fresh water in the Mediterranean Sea. And this is decreases the, sensitive, the salinity of the Mediterranean Sea dramatically. And uh, the dramatic decrease in the salinity of the Mediterranean Sea does not allow the migration of the microorganism. But after building the high dam, this salinity is adjusted and this is allow the organisms to migrate between Red Sea to Mediterranean Sea. So the aim of our work was to investigate the microorganisms migration to find it the same, the same as happened with the macroorganisms that is migrated in according to the Lysepsian migration and to follow the pattern of migration between, micro, between two seas according to the microorganisms. Is it Lysepsian or anti Lysepsian migration? Uh, we started to collect uh, 22 samples of water from 11 different locations some of them in the Mediterranean Sea, some of them in the Suez Canal itself, and others in the Red Sea. We collected from nine cities, and from each city we, take, we took two samples, one from 10 meter depth and the other from 20 meter depth. Then we take this water sample using the Nesken handmade tubes and make filtration using the filter paper to collect the bacteria or all the microorganisms. After filtration, we use this filter paper to make DNA extraction by collagen and uh, using the DNA's extraction kit. Then we make the amplification for the 16S gene and gel electrophoresis and uh, make the sequencing by Illumina MySec and then checking the quality control filtering, trimming and dereplication by data too. Visualization of the data was done by taxonomic classification, alpha diversity and measuring beta diversity. And also we determine the fate of the migrated taxa using ANCAM, LIFC and heat map. 
After that, we used some bioinformatic tools for the alpha diversity. We used the phylogenetic C diversity, OTU, and Shannon samples. And for beta diversity, we used the Jacquard uh, priacrotic distance and the Unifrac. And also, we used the pairwise Bermanova test, Uncom test, and heat map test. Uh, to confirm our results, we found that most of the bacterial migration occurred according to the Anisepsian migration, and this was the predominant route for bacteria. And to confirm that, we depend on three evidence. The first evidence was Bermanova statistical analysis, and uh, our Bermanova statistical analysis showed that there is no significant difference between the Mediterranean Sea and the Suez Canal. No difference between the bacteria which is found in the water in Mediterranean Sea and Suez Canal water. And this is indicate that there is a similarity between the environmental, bacterial environment uh, between the Suez Canal and the Mediterranean Sea. However, there was a significant difference between Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, and also significant difference between Red Sea and Suez Canal water. The second evidence for the Lysipsian migration was uh, for our anti Lysipsian migration with the heat map. And our heat map depend on the differentiation of taxa. Uh, this heat map showed the differentiation of the all taxa collected from the 11 locations from nine cities. And uh, we depend on, uh, on this heat map for differentiation of taxa to demonstrate the anti Lysipsian migration because after we followed this uh, heat map, we found that most uh, we can know. Uh, the root exactly of each microorganism, where it is started its migration and where it ends. Does it stop in Suez Canal or it stop in one of these two seas? Uh, also, we found that some microorganisms, when it transferred from Mediterranean Sea through the Suez Canal to Red Sea, we also measured the frequency of each microorganism. So if the frequency of microorganisms started to decrease gradually through the Suez Canal until it reaches to the lowest frequency in the Red Sea, this means that this migrant is Mediterranean Sea migrant, which invade the Red Sea. And vice versa, if some microorganisms started migration from Red Sea through the Suez Canal with high frequency and started to decrease gradually until reached the Mediterranean Sea, this means that, that this uh, migrant is predominant in Red Sea and its invader for the Mediterranean Sea. The third evidence of our antilysepsian migration was ANCAM test, which is depend on the differential abundance. According to the differential abundance, we show that most of microorganisms migrated according to the antilysepsian migration from Red Sea to Mediterranean Sea. This is the results of the ANCAM test in detail. Uh, this is the three locations which is tested. Uh, the first one in the Mediterranean Sea, we found that some groups with, were uh, characteristics in the Mediterranean Sea, like candidates, like thermos, altrimumus, like uh, marinopactor, and others were predominant in Suez Canal, like polaripactor and uh, niridium, and others were predominant in Red Sea, like Cidu, Alteromonas, and Bilagri bacteria. The same results obtained with left sea. Left sea showed the same results as unbinding discrimination of between the three groups. We also proved that uh, all microorganisms are anti lysepsian migration, and the same results and the same groups were found in the three locations, same as uncom results and the same as the heat map result. For the phase phylogenetic diversity, we use the cross call was statistical analysis, and we also found there is non significant difference between Mediterranean Sea and Suez Canal water. Same results obtained by unweighed unifrac test. There was an overlapping between the two groups, Mediterranean Sea and Suez Canal, and the non-significant uh, and significant difference between the Red Sea. And also the same results was confirmed uh, using the unifrac PQO plot test according to the principal coordination. The phylogenetic relationship between each group was obtained according to the dots. And also the same happened. Uh, there was a uh, correlation between the Mediterranean Sea and Suez Canal microorganisms. The taxonomical classification of microorganisms, which is found in our uh, study, according to the phylum level, indicated similarity between the uh, phylum, uh, which is found in the Mediterranean Sea and the Suez Canal. 
The same happened also at the family level and at the genus level also the same results were obtained. Using experiment correlation test to correlate between the bacterial genus, as you can see in the photo, the dark uh, blue uh, spots or circles, this is indicate strong positive correlation, while the red color circles, this is indicate negative correlations between the microorganisms. And as we can see that most of the strong correlations happened between microorganisms, which is found in the Mediterranean Sea and the Suez Canal water. The same results obtained using the heat map for the sperm correlation. Also the strong correlation showed as uh, dark blue color and the negative correlation as red color. And this is also confirmed the same results. In conclusion, we can say that the anti-sperm migration is more predominant than the reception migration in the bacterial community. And this is similar to what found before for the macroorganisms. So our microorganisms are also migrate in the same way like macroorganisms. We found seven anti-reception migrant, which is colonized in the Suez Canal, and another seven taxa present in higher abundance in Suez Canal. Uh, our recommendations in this study, there are several uh, questions which is raised. One of them, why is the anti-reception migration is more predominant than the reception one? And why certain taxa stop migration at the Suez Canal and others continue the migration to the sea? Why do certain taxa present in higher frequency in the Suez Canal? And which, continue, uh, which taxa uh, should continue migration to the ocean? And what is the impact of anti-reception migration on bacterial community? Uh, finally, we can say that uh, there are many questions still uh, raised up during this study, and to understand the microbial diversity, we should concentrate more about the uh, ecosystem and the biodiversity occurred and happened in each place. I would like to thank uh, all my partners and thank uh, all the organization committee, and thank you for you for your listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaima. So if you can, uh, thank you for this interesting presentation. Okay. If you can just uh, stop the sharing. Okay. And now we have uh, Dr. Ramia from University of Jordan. Yes. Um, okay, Dr. you are welcome. Thank you, thank you. Doctor, I will share my screen. Okay. So you are professional more than us. <laughs> <laughs> true, very true. Yeah. And thanks a lot. Yeah, you saved You're us. You're welcome. You're welcome. We are welcome, Doctor. <laughs> Most fine. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. First of all, hello from Jordan to Bilad al Rafidain al Azima. Thank you very much. Hello. To Iraq. Um, my name is Rami Al Bakayin. I am an associate professor of analytical and bioanalytical chemistry at the University of Jordan in Amman. Uh, my presentation under the title of Comprehensive Chromatographic Profiling of Cannabis from a 23 USA states marketed for medical purposes. This work uh, was under the uh, fund of uh, Fulbright uh, because I was a Fulbright awardee in 2017-2008 and also with the help um, of the University of Jordan. What is cannabis? Cannabis, in fact, is a complex species containing large numbers of active ingredients. We can find cannabis in three forms, in the form of herbal cannabis named marijuana, or cannabis resin as hashish named hashish, or hashish oil, which is extracts of cannabis resin. The two, in fact, active ingredients in cannabis plant are the first, which is the major, uh, which is named cannabinoids, such as CPD, CPG, THC, etc., And the second ingredient um, called terpenoids that are responsible for cannabis distinctive odor. Cannabis in fact has wide medical usage these days uh, because we can use Cannab cannabis for treating main chronic diseases such as Alzheimer, cancer, epilepsy, 
hepatitis C, AIDS, glaucoma, multiple sclerosis, stress disorder, chronic pain, etc. In fact, there are many medicines based on various cannabis. For example, we can use oral Delta 9 THC to prepare marinol. And another example, we can use Delta 8 THC joined with CBD to prepare oral mucosal spray because this spray contains one-to-one -one ratio of two cannabinoids. Um, let's go to the objectives of my work and uh, my team also. Uh, the first objective was to identify the compounds most important in distinguishing cannabis varieties in USA states. The second objective to find the variation on cannabis chemical profiles as a result of growing plants in different environments in different states in USA. And the third objective was to create a method to predict the origin of unknown cannabis plants. Let's go together to the experimental part. At first, cannabis was selected from 23 USA states. Then we collect them in a tightly closed plastic bags. We dried the cannabis samples. After that, we grinded them. After that, we went to the chemical preparation, sample preparation by adding 100 milligram in three mil mixture of methanol chloroform. And we added also internal standard to, uh, to the mixture. After that, we run ultrasonication for 15 minutes, then followed by centrifuge for 30 seconds and at 2000 round per minute. And finally, the extract was filtered and collected in a screw capped amber vials. Now the sample preparation step was done. Going to the chromatographic analysis. In fact, the chromatographic analysis was carried out using GCFID, which is gas chromatography with FID detector. Now the condition simply, we use a column, Agilent column with 30 meter length and 0.25 micrometer DP and 0.25 millimeter ID internal diameter. We use a standard stock solution for a maximum number of cannabinoids and terpenoids. We prepare them as a standard in a pure methanol. Then we injected them individually into identical injection to determine the retention time, as you know, because the GC depends on the retention time to identify the compounds, if we use GCFID, for sure. Then the average retention time was registered. After finishing the injection and taking the result, we calculated the peak area ratio according to the uh, equation, peak area of solute divided by peak area of internal standard. After finishing all this calculation, in fact, we used a numerical analysis. Numerical analysis was carried out using Chemoface software, which is a statistical software. Because Chemoface software can help us to show up the figures of principal component analysis and the cluster analysis. It can help us to um, reveal, in fact, uh, the, um, let's say, reveal the results as figures, which help us, in fact, to reduce the complexity of multivariate data. Because um, in my case, in my project, I had more than 450 samples of cannabinoids. So using PCA and HCA, which is a principal component analysis and the cluster analysis by the help and the aid of chemophase, helped me again to reduce the complexity of multivariate data without losing important information. And also to observe variance in data sets and vis visualize data clustering. So to brief, why we use numerical analysis in analytical chemistry in a wide uh, in a wide range because it, it can help us to clearly differentiate uh, among cannabis states, to specify the compounds responsible for clustering the groups, and finally to predict the origin of unknown future samples. Let's go to the results. 
In fact, we obtain a chemical profile of cannabis samples obtained from the 23 USA states. It contains 45 active ingredients. Each plant samples uh, contains 45 active ingredients. We succeeded to obtain these 45 active compounds. Um, in fact, if you look to this table, you can see here the, the percentage of the content. But if you look to this table, it is difficult, in fact, to distinguish which compound uh, the responsible for the clustering, for example, the state, which state or states are similar in their contents, and which state are or is different than others. So we went directly to data analysis and the classification of states based on cannabinoids and terpenoids content that was carried out using chemophase, which is principal component analysis and cluster analysis. Cluster analysis, as Dindogram showed in this, in this uh, image, in fact, the 23 states, as you can see here, were clustered in three groups. Group A, that contains 11 states. Group B contains only one state. Group C contains 11 states. What does that mean? What is the objective of this dendrogram? What we can understand from this dendrogram? It means that, for example, the first group A contains 11 states. They cluster in one cluster. It means that these states have the same or so close cannabis contents. The same for group C. What about group B, which contains only one state? It means that it is different than the others and it is it has different content than the other a cluster which means that cluster a is different than cluster b different than cluster c looking to the principal component analysis it helps us in fact to know which compounds is responsible or are responsible for the clustering for separating the states we notice here that delta 9 THC, CBN as cannabinoids, and fincol were the responsible compounds for differentiating the states. Looking to this figure, we can notice here that it is a, let's say it is complement figure to the dendrogram that showed before. Here in this figure, we can see the three cluster of the states. Washington and 11 states here and 11 states here. It means here that these states are similar in their contents. Here, the 11 states are similar to each other. Washington state here is totally different than the others. Now, if we look to our results, we notice that only think coal has an impact in our results as a terpenoid, as a ter terpenols. Why think coal has relatively high content in the majority of our collected sample? We run a research, in fact, because normally cannabinoids are the responsible for clustering. But when we search in our case, why also think coal as a terpenol is responsible for clustering? We found that think coal is different from the others, because it refers to the growing condition, such as groundwater mineral content, soil growing medium, mineral content, soil condition, temperature, age of the plant, maturity of the plant, storage conditions. In fact, why the classification of states depends normally in cannabinoids and not terpeno terpe terpenols. As I mentioned before, this refers to these conditions. And now, I would like to mention here that terpenes in general, terpenes revel, vary dramatically, not just from one growing region to another, but from one plant to another, so that we depend normally in cannabinoids um, to classify the plants. Now, we run another study also in the same project, and I can show it as a figure. This figure show the overall content 
percentage of cannabinoids and terpenol in each state group, in each cluster. If you look here in comparison between terpenoids and cannabinoids, cannabinoids uh, compounds were the dominant content in all samples in comparison to terpenoids. And this is logic and it is very well known result. And the second note, we notice that the, there are three compounds Finkel, Delta 9 THC, and CBN, these three compounds were the responsible to, to cluster the states, which means that these compounds are, are the most important content in cannabis plants. And we can use them, in fact, to cluster or to differentiate or to distinguish the cannabis plants. So to brief, Finkel, CBN, and Delta 9 THC, seems to be the most significant contents for cannabis clustering with comprehensive clinical profiles. The second note, Delta 9 THC, CBN, and Fincol were of high efficiency to separate large number of states, USA states from the rest. Delta 9 THC, CBN from cannabinoids family and Fincol from terpenoids group showed the highest content over all components. The conclusion of this project, the first conclusion is the obtained profiles were used to cluster cannabis samples with the aid of PCA and cluster analysis because without chemophase, without the numerical analysis, we cannot treat our data because our data were really huge. The second conclusion that the clustering results showed uncovered, would, sorry, would uncover the geographic origin of grown cannabis plants. The third conclusion is that multivariate analysis showed also which contents are critical in discriminating the cultivars and the states in USA states. And finally, among the states, Washington, Oregon, California, and Hawaii have the highest cannabis contents. Finally, I would like to thank uh, you for your listening. And uh, I would like to thank my team Professor Yahya Addex from the Hashemite University in Jordan, Professor James uh, from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry University of Mississippi, and the Professor Mahmoud Sohali from the National Center for Natural Product Research and Department of Pharmacy. And thank also my funder, the Fulbright uh, Commission Office in Jordan and the University of Jordan. Thank you so much for your attention. Most welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ramia, for this nice and clear talk. I will stop sharing now. Yes, really, it's very interesting. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you very much. So this is just a reminder for the audience. They can ask a question by the sending message through the chat or through the question and answers panel. Okay, Prof. Shamsun, do you have anything to say? Um, it's very wonderful presentation from uh, the, all the speakers. It's a wonderful presentation. So I'm very much, um, it's a comment rather than a question. And uh, how did you get these so many samples? So it's, the question is to um, Prof. Ramya. So did you, uh, did you follow any specific um, order to collect the samples? Like, in fact, this work was carried out in uh, the Natural Center um, at the University of Mississippi in USA during the oh. year 2017-2018. The mm -hmm. samples were, uh, in fact, uh, kept in a vault and then at the National oh. Center because this center is the only center in USA that is, in fact, uh, if I would say that is uh, allowed to have to have uh, cannabis and uh, oh. Professor Asuhali, he's one of the most figure scientists in this field. Mm -hmm. So um, the samples was there as a plant. Okay. I, in fact, I uh, got them. I, we, we call it, uh, as you know, as a natural uh, professor, you know, we manicure 
the sample, yeah. mm -hmm. we okay. manicure uh, more than 495 samples separately. Mm -hmm. We so manicure them. Manicure these them. were from different sources. Like, did you exactly. know? The, did you know? Take a note of the different sources of the samples, because I think uh, one of the reason is that we are, you uh, you were trying to identify uh, the origin of the cannabis, isn't it? Can you repeat it? Because it was cut off for a moment. Oh, sorry. So my question is that uh, the source resources like source of the samples like uh, is it a factor for the origin to identify can it help to identify the origin of the cannabis or something yes yes in fact yes we can in fact by uh, because uh, each each plant samples from each state has his its own profile so at the end if we took a non sample for example and we mm -hmm. carry we run analysis for this sample and we collect the results, we can put them in the principal component analysis or cluster analysis. It can help us to distinguish in which state it is, um, it comes from. So in fact, the project has many, many um, aims, but one of the most important aims to predict the samples from where it comes in the future, because I can do this research, you can do this research, but in fact, it takes a huge time and a huge effort consuming solvents and time. So in the future, this will help us if we have a plant sample, cannabis plant sample, for example, from one origin in a, from one state, by distinguishing its concentration, we can put them in our data map and it can predict us from where this sample. Uh, okay, so thank one, you very much. Thing. Thank you. So I think uh, let us finish the other speakers uh, and then we can return back to answer any question or to do the discussion. Thank you. Also now we have Dr. Ayara. Okay, Dr. you are welcome. Yeah. And you, the mic is for you. Okay, hello everybody. Hello. hello. I'd like to express my gratitude being um, one of the members of such a great that I would like to thank the uh, University of uh, My topic for today will be uh, I will discuss uh, digital technology, how we use them that we in the computer age. Uh, how the digital technology affects the uh, internet application generally, uh, and especially the implant uh, dentistry branch. Uh, I'm Yara Kamun, I'm a system lecturer, uh, faculty of dentistry in the Monroe University. Uh, technology is mandatory in our everyday activities. I think we figure out how important uh, technology, especially in the days of coronavirus crisis, uh, after global lockdown, all our daily activities uh, transform it into digital form, uh, conferences, workshops, school, education, paperwork, and so on. So in this uh, industry, digital workflows are becoming more popular and more active. Uh, the increase in the, in the popularity and the demand for use of dental implants to replace teeth has motivated advancement in the clinical technology and materials to improve patient acceptance and clinical outcomes. Present day advances have led uh, to the incorporation of the computer aided design, computer aided manufacturing, CAD CAM technology into the design and the fabrication of implant dental restoration. Uh, any digital uh, workflow uh, contains data scanning, designing, and uh, manufacturing. Scanning uh, is the first sequence. Hey, Doctor, I, sorry to interrupt you. I think you have a problem with your mic. Just yes. you, you try to. Okay. The voice you hear is me now? Uh, you hear me now, Doctor? Yes, yes, it is. Okay. A bit better. Thank you. Your work. Uh, the first sequence is to capture or record the intra oral compression to the computer. The second sequence, once the data has been recorded to the computer software program CAD, is used to complete the design of the final desired restoration. The final sequence is the CAM, is the computer manufacturing for fabrication of the, of the, from the design uh, in the CAD program. Uh, scanning uh, in dentistry, uh, our invented the uh, workflow uh, in implant dentistry, of clinical data collection 
using a 3D radiograph, digital photograph, intraoral or extraoral scan. Uh, 3D dimension dental radiograph, the most common uh, used uh, 3D imaging technology is the Compeen uh, Computer Tomography, CBTP. Uh, it guides me in diagnosis, treatment, and follow up. And offers numerous advantages when compared to traditional 2D radiology, including lack of superimposition, one to one measurement, the absence of geometric distortion, and of course, the 3D, the 3D display. The second tool uh, for data entry uh, is the intraoral camera, designed to allow and capture images and allow me to compare the patient's decision in the plan, the patient's dental patient's oral cavity. So I, I let him see what I see to, to convince him with the treatment plan and the uh, procedure that we see uh, performed later. Third tool is the intraoral scanner. The intraoral scanner offered me a uh, three-in-one digital image, 3D colored impression. Uh, I capture images in the intraoral cavity and I make uh, shade measures. So I can predict or um, uh, know the actual uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, color of the tooth. So if, uh, if you visit the dentist, you know this traditional impression, okay? It only captures the four. But by the digital impression, I captured the form, the shape, and I can uh, preserve photos as uh, a digital file for the patient. Uh, extra oral laparoscopic scanner. Uh, if I don't have an intra oral scanner in my, in my clinic, so there are clinic um, uh, scanners in the lab after making impression. I can scan this impression or a cast. Special scanners, special scanners to provide 3D dimensional tomography of the facial surface anatomy, to make facial landmark recognition and analysis of the symmetry and proportions of the face. And if you ask me um, how can I apply in implant dentistry, uh, I, I can apply especially in cases when I want to make implant rehabilitation uh, with aesthetic requirements. I can study the uh, face aesthetic, the proportion of the face, uh, to provide the patient with. Um, uh, uh, aesthetic restoration. The facial dynamic 4D facial dynamics provide a measurable understanding of soft tissue mobility through anatomical motion and facial expression. Uh, especially if I want to rehabilitate a case with two slots, I want a face implant and um, lots of uh, part of the face in, uh, in case of gunshot accident, uh, trauma, after uh, eradication of a tumor. Uh, and sometimes uh, we don't only restore uh, tools or bone, we restore um, a facial procedure for the face. Motion uh, uh, provides realistic animation uh, in the, in, for the inter uh, entertainment industry, but we industry use them for the uh, musculoskeletal biomechanics. And uh, in the dental field, the uh, most common, uh, yeah, we, we, we deal with only one uh, jaw, is the central mandibular joint. And in some situations, we want to record the mandibular movement, okay, to integrate uh, this movement in our rehabilitation process. So, if I do scanning for uh, the intraoral cavity, the mandibular movement, the facial movement, uh, so I will shift to design. I want to design or the, uh, start to plan for this case. After collection of this data from scanners or uh, CBTs, I make what we call a superimposition. We make merging. We merge data on the software tools to properly uh, treat this patient. Especially that, now we have a lot of dentistry. So I merge the opposing, opposing arch of the case. I merge the anatomical structure, the flow of the nose. And I can place plan to place my implant in relation to the neighboring vital structure. So I can take care of the, uh, uh, how I'll be away from the interior alveolar nerve, uh, floor of the nose and vestibular sinuses, the proper angulation, and I will show you um, a real video of it. I uh, mentioned that we uh, use CBCT to evaluate and to place implant. And we get after implant placement, I can uh, precisely see each implant 
location in the phone, I can evaluate the angulation of the instant placement, and I can evaluate the amount of phone notes that I, I want to make follow up. And here, if you see with me, this is the interior alveolar nerve. Through the way, uh, during my planning, of my evaluation, I can trace the vital structure. I can trace the nerve. Okay, and I'll see the um, uh, I want if I want to flip implant here, I can measure the buccal lingual dimension of the bone. I can also measure the available length. Okay, and we put about two millimeter source of error during planning. I, 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 and I, as you see, I, I shifted, I, I moved two millimeters to be away, away from the vital structure. And uh, if I'm not satisfied about this um, length, I can shift to another area in the bone. And the plan to place implant, as you see with me, I'm moving. I'm moving here, I'm moving here, and I'm moving here. And um, I, I reached an area I want to place implant. Uh, I measure the width and the length. And by the way, in, in the regular scenario, I, I place implant vertically, so I will be placed implant short. The CPC allow me to place the implant, tilted implant with the proper. The proper length 12 millimeters from the five or six millimeters in the previous scenario. So I can perform my operation and I'll shift to the manufacturing or the computer aided manufacturing. The computer aided uh, manufacturing implant please two types additive manufacturing and subtractive manufacturing. The additive manufacturing is defined as the process by joining materials to make physical objects from 3D. سوري دكتورة يارا تفضل اكو مشكلة بالصوت ممكن تتكلمين بدون مايك يعني اذا من المباشر اعتقد احسن اوكي يو هير مي ناو؟ اي ثينك اتس بيتر لايك ذيس اوكي اوكي يو ثانك يو فيري ماتش اوكي ذا مانيفاكشر ديفايند از ذا بروسيس باي جوينينج ماتيريال تو ميك فيزيكال اوبجيكت فروم سي تي موديل داتا اديتيف مانيفاكشرينج باي بيلدينج اب اور ادينج اور ديبوزيتينج Material layer by layer in a horizontal fashion. The subtractive manufacturing is the process by which 3D objects are constructed by cutting, either form drilling or milling from a large block or sheet to uh, get the object we want. In lastly, the adaptive manufacturing example, say lithography, we use it for the resin, fuse uh, um, the position. Uh, this is uh, to me uh, 
Neosys has Yomi. pioneered the first robotic-assisted guidance system for dental implant surgery, called Yomi. It provides it dynamic planning software that can be changed at any time. Real-time visual guidance so the surgeon can confirm their progress. And physical guidance through a collaborative robotic arm. With real-time patient tracking throughout the surgery. The procedure starts with a CT scan of the patient. The surgeon plans the surgery, accounting for key anatomical features like the nerve, sinus, and adjacent teeth. Yomi achieves physical guidance through the use of haptic robotic technology. It physically constrains the surgeon's drill movement to match the plan. As soon as planning is complete, Yomi is immediately ready to assist the surgeon in carrying out the surgery the same day. Yomi's real-time visual guidance works like a GPS system. The surgeon always controls the drill. When the surgeon is close to the target, Yomi guides the surgeon into the precise angle and position. Yomi prevents any deviation from the plan. With full view of the surgical site, the surgeon precisely drills the osteotomy and is stopped when reaching the planned depth. This enables a minimally invasive, flapless approach. I can place my implants under uh, uh, robotic guidance. Okay. Technology is a uh, useful service, but a dangerous master. Uh, my active technology, uh, there is no substitute uh, for the human mind. Uh, and I would like to thank my team, Professor Dr. Ahram Sharqawi, Professor Dr. Mahdur Hamid, Dr. Rania, Dr. Amal, and my colleagues. Uh, and thank you, and ready for any questions. Okay, Dr. Ayala, thank you very much. It's really very nice and great work. So now we have the last speaker for our session, which is Dr. Daniel. Okay. Uh, for my colleagues, uh, you can ask questions using the question and chat boxes. Okay, Dr. Daniel. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here joining you in this uh, very nice uh, forum of uh, Women uh, and Science Without Borders. So I'm going to share my screen then. Okay, yes, okay. please. Thank you, Dr. Mahdi. Thank you very much. So, um, my presentation is about the serendipitous discovery of uh, phenylketonuria in Iraq, how to identify and treat. Um, so I'm going to give a brief background about the disease, uh, which we call PKU, right? So PKU is a rare autosomal res uh, recessive inborn error of phenylalanine metabolism caused by inherited deficiency in the enzyme uh, phenylalanine hydroxylase, the PHA, that converts phenylalanine into tyrosine, resulting in elevated levels of the essential amino acid phenylalanine and reduced levels of tyrosine. So here, just to remember uh, the reaction catalyzed by the enzyme, phenylalanine hydroxylase producing tyrosine, um, and also uh, after that, then uh, the production of melanin and DOPA, for example, that would come from uh, the phenylalanine in the beginning, right? So here, just uh, this reaction, just to show that uh, we have a cofactor that's also needed for that reaction to happen, which is the tetrahydrobiopterin, uh, BH4. So by that reaction, the same that I showed before, we are going to get tyrosine. And also, if we are considering neurons, then we are going to have, after uh, the formation of tyrosine, DOPA. And if we are talking about the melanocytes, then also the production of melanin. So all of that related with the uh, phenylalanine amino acid, which is an essential amino acid. The disease is caused by different gene uh, variations of the enzyme, uh, phenylalanine hydroxylase, and also the severity of the disease range from uh, mild to severe, based on the residual enzyme activity 
and also based on the level of phenylalanine circulating in the blood. If untreated or undiagnosed, the neurotoxic effects of increased Fe concentrations in blood and also in the brain can lead to uh, impaired postnatal uh, cognitive development. High blood and brain phenylalanine concentrations in patients with PKU are often associated with poor neurocognitive, neuropsychiatric, behavioral, as well as physical out outcomes such as seizure and delayed motor development as well. So it's a severe condition, can become a very severe condition. Uh, the early detect, uh, detection of PKU in the symptomatic period and treatment with phenylalanine restricted diet is warranted to ensure a normal development. So it's, uh, it's all about the diet. The patient can live a normal life if uh, uh, the patient receives the correct uh, treatment. Management of PKU should be maintained uh, throughout the life and initiate as soon as possible after diagnosis via newborn screening in order to prevent a irre reversible damage. A strict blood phenylalanine control uh, is of a primary importance for an optimal outcome, particularly during the first years of life. So that must start in the first years of life. The management of PKU uh, comprise the reduction of dietary intake of phenylalanine, which can be uh, done by low protein diets and fee-free amino acid supplements as well, and uh, may include low protein supplements and foods. Additionally, we know that uh, we have some medications that also can be uh, given for these patients depending on their uh, exactly on the on the condition that they have. So, for example, sub uh, propterine uh, dehydrochloride, which is a synthetic version of the cofactor for the phenylalanine hydroxylase, uh, uh, which is this co uh, that cofactor is the naturally occurring for the enzyme. So we have the synthetic one that can be given as a medication, but that uh, can also uh, can just be applied if the patient is responsive, responsive uh, to the stimulation for the cofactor, if there is a residual uh, enzyme activity. So just on that case, then the medication uh, works. Newborn screening is a fundamental public health intervention it started uh, several decades ago uh, to allow early PKU diagnosis and treatment ultimately preventing irreversible damage, such as neurological impairment and mental retardation. Uh, the first uh, uh, newborn screen program was originated in the US in the early 60s and became present in most developed countries, as we know nowadays. Today, clinical manifestations of classic PKU are well controlled in developed countries where the newborn screen is pre, uh, prevalent and where there is availability of supplement uh, plus or uh, low protein foods. Newborn screen programs involve the clinical and laboratory examination of neonates who exhibit the no uh, health problems with the aim of discovering those infants who are in fact suffering from a treatable condition so phenylketonuria is a treatable condition. And here I have some pictures just to um, give one idea how the newborn screen, uh, screening is done uh, worldwide. So first, uh, before a baby leaves the hospital, after the, 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 the baby is born, then before leaving the hospital, a healthcare provider pricks the baby's heel to get a few drops of blood. So it's simple how to get the sample. The blood drops are placed and dried on a special paper. Uh, and this should happen within uh, 48 hours of a baby's birth. So the time here, time, the time frame is also very important. Within 24 hours of the heel stick, 
the paper with blood draw should be sent to a newborn screening lab for testing for the, the determination of the amino acid concentration. Within five days of birth, uh, results uh, for time critical conditions should be shared with the baby's provider. And if uh, within seven days of birth, the results for all uh, other conditions should be shared with the baby's provider. And then, so uh, all newborn screening results should be reported to the baby's provider uh, in the maximum time of seven days of birth. And then if there is a negative screen, what would be the, the steps? So the provider needs to be notified. Then the provider should follow up with the baby's family after that. If the parents don't hear about the results, they should call and ask the provider about that because the time uh, frame is really important in order to treat and prevent uh, uh, neurocentral uh, damage. If the, uh, the patient or the baby gets a positive screen, then the provider needs to be notified. <clears throat> uh, the provider follows up with the baby's family for further testing. The diagnostic test must be done immediately to confirm the results. And then the intervention should begin as soon as possible after that. So uh, what's the situation here uh, in Iraq, right? Uh, we saw, we found that in a recent effort by health workers from different international organizations, including me, uh, to help families with children uh, with special needs uh, in uh, KIRG region, some of these children uh, were found to be positive for PKU. So we were, we, uh, we were not looking for uh, specifically for uh, the PKU patients that time, but uh, we, uh, we found that these special needs children, they were positive for the disease. Since then, it has been discovered around 33 children in Kurdistan needing help due to the PKU. And just to um, show, to give one idea of the situation, I am gonna show here a study case in Kurdistan. So in this context, a nine-year-old boy diagnosed with cerebral palsy was mistreated with a high-protein diet for three years until the family changed the doctors and the PKU diagnosis was made. So in the past three years of being on the PKU diet and metabolic formula, formula the boy has improved significantly the frequency of seizures, because he was having seizures before, the frequency of seizures have decreased and the boy is able to walk with some assistance though. However, he is unable to uh, talk, understand the yes or no, or to do any activity of daily living independently because he already uh, has um, a brain damage, right? And because of the time that he was without the the treatment, treatment needed. So because of that, taking all of these um, observations in consideration, the purpose of uh, our work, the main one um, is uh, to raise aware awareness and bring it to the forefront, the urgent need for prevalent newborn screening in Iraq, in Iraq as well as uh, the urgent need of appropriate treatment of PKU patients including access to uh, phenylalanine-free amino acid supplements, which may include low protein supplements and foods, uh, which is critical in preventing the detrimental outcomes of PKU. The urgent need for support information for the families with PKU patients in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Uh, also to highlight the challenges, challenges and possible solutions for uh, going forward. So here, just to highlight the, the problem regarding the lack of the newborn screening uh, in Iraq. So largely PKU and other metabolic disorders have not been systematically evaluated and reported uh, in Iraq, including KRG. So because of that metabolic disorders, including P uh, PKU, have possibly been underestimated. 
with also another factor is that with the high incidence of consanguine marriages in the Middle East in general, there is increasing prevalence of PKU and other metabolic disorders as well. We know that the overall worldwide prevalence of PKU is uh, about 6,000 per um, 100,000 neonates. And the highest prevalence uh, was reported in Turkey, while the lowest in Thailand. And we have a paper published in 2013 uh, indicating that from seven cases det detected with PKU in Iraq, all of them had had, had consanguineous uh, parents, just showing us the importance of this understanding as well. Uh, unfortunately, a newborn screen has not yet become prevalent in Iraq, including uh, KRG. Tools, the screening for metabolic disorders or philodenine level is not normally requested until the patient is already uh, having symptoms. In some cases, symptoms are uh, treated uh, without even considering the possibility of a PKU diagnosis. That's the full range situation in general, as uh, we have found up to now. Uh, the absence of newborn screening leaves the population vulnerable to the delayed diagnosis of PKU and other uh, metabolic diseases as well that could be detected early, giving the person the opportunity to seek appropriate treatment. We know that because we have some papers um, showing that, uh, that in the Arabic countries, uh, only a few countries such as Saudi Arabia, United uh, Arab Emirates, Qatar and Turkey have implemented comprehensive national newborn screen programs with uh, relatively high coverage to aim uh, for early detection of PKU along with other treatable disorders in an attempt to reduce disability rates. Uh, besides just the, the phenylalanine uh, uh, measurement or screening, the metabolic disorder, uh, disorder screening uh, is very important for the symptomatic infants, uh, children and adults as well, especially in the situation that we have now, especially in the absence of newborn screening. However, as with all chronic uh, disorders, long-term management can be challenging and many adult patients with PKU become lost to follow up. In the KRG, only two uh, laboratories, one in Dohuk, another one in Suleimania, were found uh, where measurements of amino acids can be done. In addition to a panel that helps diagnose other rare metabolic disorders, the amino, and we know that the amino acid panel is crucial for the monitoring and adjustment of a, a patient's diet. So actually for the treatment of the patient. Um, about the supply of metabolic formula in Iraq, we found that the central government in Baghdad is the official provider of the metabolic formulas to all the Iraq territory, including uh, KRG. Unfortunately, uh, we found that due to the continuous conflicts inside our territory, the provision of formula from Baghdad to KRG is not co uh, consistent nor in sufficient quantities. And that increases, uh, of course, the frustration of the families and healthcare professionals uh, that are dealing with the, the disease and with the patients. As a consequence of constant conflicts, also that we have the problem that the healthcare system has been disrupted and the universe system adversely affected, resulting in a general lack of awareness and understanding regarding to diagnosis, treatment, and ongoing management of PKU and other uh, rare metabolic disorders as well among the local healthcare professionals. With the lack of specialists and lack of uh, consistent supply of metabolic formula in Iraq, many families seek assistance in Iran and Turkey, which hinders the ability for regular follow-up. 
due to travel restrictions and, uh, and or for, uh, because of uh, financial problems. We found that uh, multiple parents have reported not following up with their physicians in Turkey or Eden for months. In some cases, uh, even over a year due to not being able to travel. In one case, for example, a child uh, remained on the same diet plan for over a year, losing rather than gaining weight, which is a very uh, not good condition. And then I just would like to show about the guidelines that we have from 2014, the gu guidelines to treat PKU. So these uh, guidelines contain the recommendations regarding diagnosis, treatment, and care for patients with PKU of all ages. And we understand that implementing these gui uh, guidelines um, would improve access uh, to screening, treatment, and monitoring of the, the, the patients. This plan would also include education about chronic conditions like PKU in displaced population. That also is part of the guideline. Accurate data collection, rebuilding and um, recruiting metabolic teams and focusing on standards of care for all by uh, minimizing uh, risk. So let's just take a look on the key points of the guideline. So the treatment of PKU is lifelong with uh, a goal of maintaining the blood fee level in the range of two to six milligrams per deciliter in patients of all ages. Patients treated uh, within the early weeks of life with initial good metabolic control, but who lose uh, that control in later childhood or as an adult may experience both reversible and irreversible neuropsychiatric consequences. PKU genotyping, for example, mutation analysis is recommended for uh, improved therapy planning. Medical foods uh, such as formula in foods modified to be low in protein are medically necessary for people living in, uh, with PKU and should be regarded as medications. Any combination of therapies, medical foods, medication itself, Kuvan, for example, that improve a patient's blood fee level uh, can be considered as appropriate and should be individualized. Uh, the reduction of blood fee level, in, uh, increase in fee tolerance or improvement in clinical symptoms of PKU are all valid indications to continue a particular therapy. Genetic counseling should be provided as an ongoing process for individuals with PKU and their families. Due to an increased risk for neurocognitive and uh, psychological issues, regular mental health monitoring is warranted. A number of screening tests are recommended to identify those in need of further assessment. Uh, blood fee uh, level should be monitored at a consistent time during the day, preferably uh, two up to three hours after eating. So taking all of these uh, observations uh, into consideration, our conclusions up to this moment are um, that uh, we need in uh, behalf of the Iraqi population, there is a huge need and urgent need for the establishment of regulations about the delivery of metabolic formula from Baghdad to local uh, health agencies, including, of course, uh, KIRG, responsible uh, for receiving the metabolic formula and then distributing it uh, to the families with relatives diagnosed with the disease. Also, uh, raising awareness about consanguine marriage and associated disease, including PKU, development of programs for education and training of government officials and those in the healthcare system on the importance of newborn screening and the specialized PKU diet. Collaboration with international healthcare professionals and metabolic specialists for training. Uh, implementation of prevalent newborn screen across Iraq. Uh, which would allow early PKU diagnosis and treatment and counseling of local healthcare professionals. Implementing the key recommendations for PKU management according to the current guideline, which is from 2014, 
from the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. Also, uh, we know that further discussions and research is uh, required to understand chronic uh, health needs due to the PKU and effects on uh, future generations. Due to the continuing crisis in Iraq, uh, we understand that the international assistance is needed in this time to accomplish the previously mentioned uh, goals. So we reported that uh, and uh, our findings were accepted for publication. So maybe in the coming weeks, uh, that's going to be published. And I would like to thank our team and uh, collaborators that would include Dr. Amar Abdullah from the University of Duhuk, and also our volunteers, uh, Rebecca Thompson, Laila Dakil Vioko, and Caitlin Michelle Cobb as well. Thank you very much for your time and for your attention. And uh, we all would be happy to answer if there is any question. <laughs> I need to stop sharing, right? Okay. I guess I was the last one, the last presenter, right? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Daniel. You're welcome, my pleasure. Thank you. It's a really nice presentation. So thank now you. we have the time for questions or any clarification. If anyone has any question, you can write to the chat box or question box. I just would like to uh, congratulate my colleagues because I enjoyed very much the, their presentation, the level, the quality of the, the science done, uh, which was shown by their presentations. It was very, it was a pleasure to, to follow and listen. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. So if there is no question, I think we can end this session. Can I say something before ending the session? Yes, yeah, sure, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Mahdi, and thank you for all the presenter. I really enjoyed, enjoyed each presentation. Thank you for meeting you even virtually. Hope to see you <laughs> next time in, in, in person. Hope inshallah. next year, inshallah. 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 Also, I would like to thank everyone, and it is really my pleasure to meet you all, the speakers and the audience. I hope everyone enjoyed and get benefit from this uh, session. So, really, it's a short time, but I think uh, it's a good experience and nice to have you all. It's a matter of equality, not time matter, Dr. Mehdi, if you do yeah, agree I, with me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Our meeting is just yes. for our <laughs> time. Yes, so, by learn. the way, Dr. Amir, so you are my colleague as the Fulbrighter. <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. which year, Dr. Mehdi? 2014, I think, I went to Oklahoma. Mm, I yeah. went 2017 to Mississippi. Okay, so, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Nice experience. Yes, oh. for sure. Fulbright, it's uh, not only a privilege, it's really uh, an experience to work, to, to share experience with others and to get more benefit, you know, in scientific uh, field. Yes, sure. Yes. So, in Kurdish, خير هاتنا هميات كين من أرابيك مرحبا بالجميع وشرفتونا شرفنا بيك دكتور مهدي
شكرا جزيلا بالجميع وبالجميع ان شاء الله ان انجلش ثانك يو ايفري وان اند يو موست ويلكم ثانك يو فيري ماتش يو ويل بي سيف ثانك يو فيري ماتش يلا ثانك يو Take care. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Stay safe. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.